thee, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. And the title of my sermon tonight is Science Falsely So Called. Now, first of all, just the fact that we're reading about this in the book of 1 Timothy, where Paul is speaking to his young protege in the ministry, obviously all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. It's for our admonition 2,000 years later. But it was also written specifically to one man, Timothy, to give him some advice at that time that he would need. It's also for us today. The whole Bible is something that we can learn from today. Why? Because there is nothing new under the sun. The same preaching that people needed to hear back 2,000 years ago in Timothy's day is the same type of preaching we need to hear today. The same type of sins that people are dealing with, false doctrines that are uh, uh, abound today, those abounded thousands of years ago as well. Things have always been similar to the way that they are in this regard. And so when Paul is telling Timothy to avoid oppositions of science falsely so called, that means that approximately 2,000 years ago when this was being written, there was science that was placing itself in opposition with the Bible. Now we today, we think this is something new, don't we? We think, well, you know, for all these thousands and thousands of years, you know, uh, everybody just believed in God and they just believed in the Bible. And then all of a sudden, science came along and started to oppose the Bible and disprove the Bible. And now we have this brand new battle, this brand new argument between science and the Bible. No, it's always been around. Even back then, people were trying to use so-called science to disprove God's Word or to oppose, as the Bible used the word, God's Word. And Paul is telling Timothy, and really God is telling Timothy, because God's the author of the Bible, he's telling him to avoid profane and vain babblings. And notice, he's putting that right in the same category, these babblings, with science. Why? Because the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. That's why. He says, avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called which some professing have heard concerning the faith grace be with thee amen he said even back then some had already heard from the faith by listening to the scientists of their day 2,000 years ago now what's funny about that is if we were to look back on the science of 2,000 years ago we'd probably laugh at it wouldn't we? Because I guarantee you a lot of the science that they were proclaiming in Paul and Timothy's day has already been proven false long ago. And yet today we have this delusion that all of the science that is uh, being preached and taught in our universities and and other publications that are put out uh, that promote science, we just assume that it's all true. And people in this world just blindly believe it, even though later it will be proven to be an outright lie. And it turns out it was science falsely so called. Now go to Daniel chapter 1. The book of Daniel is toward the end of the Old Testament. Daniel chapter number 1, after the three great big books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, we find the book of Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 1, we find the only other mention of science in the Bible. The Bible uses the word science twice only. He uses it once in 1 Timothy 6 when he's warning us about science that is falsely so called that opposes the word of God. And then also we find it in Daniel chapter 1 where the children of Judah have been taken captive by the Babylonians, by Nebuchadnezzar. And when they took these captives, many of them were children. And they wanted to find the best and the brightest of these children. And they wanted to bring them up in their teachings and their doctrines and in their ways and in their culture so that they could tap into those minds, tap into the talented that they had taken captive. Look if you would at verse number 3. It says, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish. So he's talking about their outward appearance. Children that look good, he's saying. But well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge. And look at the next words. And understanding science. And such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, 
so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. So here by reading our Bibles, we do not see anywhere in the Bible God praising and lifting up science as being the ultimate, the final authority of what is true and what is not true. No, the final authority is the Word of God, not science. Okay? Science is mentioned twice in the Bible. Once by a heathen king who says, Oh yeah, we want to make sure we can find some kids that really understand science. You know, that's really important. And then once is by Paul warning Timothy about people who are going to try to use a false so-called science to disprove God's word. Now, let me go through several things tonight. I want to show you a lot of science today that is science falsely so called. It's lies that are put out in the name of science. And people blindly believe in it in opposition to God's word. They'll hear the science and then they'll hear God's word. And they'll say, oh yeah, but that's science. Look, we've just been brainwashed to think that science is the end all be all. Uh, go if you would to, first of all, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And you see, you say, well, what is science? What is science? Well, part of what science... And, and obviously, everybody's going to give you a different definition for what science means. Because abstract terms like that are defined differently by different people. You know, I've always been taught that the word science means knowledge. Now, that makes sense to me because I look at a word like omniscience, and it means all-knowing. Omnipotent means all-powerful. Omnipresent means present in all places at the same time. People use those three words to talk about God a lot. The Bible uses the word omnipotent in the book of Revelation. Uh, we think of omniscience, all-knowing. We think of conscience. We think of words that maybe are derived from the word science. So that seems like a pretty good definition to me. Science equals knowledge. Uh, but, but you see, when most people talk about science, what they're referring to is this process of, you know, experimentation, the testing of theories, the gathering and collating of data, the, the, the looking at studies and results and, and experimenting and, and testing and all these different things. And, you know, we have the scientific method, we have all these different evidence. I'm not going to try to define science for you tonight, okay? First of all, because I don't care about science. You say, well, how can you not care about science? Well, you know, because that's not where I get truth from. That's right. I get it from the Word of God. Okay? And so I don't need to, to know what the word science means because I only see it twice and neither time is God telling me that it's something that I need to really learn about and study and understand and, and be an expert on. Now, I'm not against science. If other people want to delve into the world of science, hey, more power to them. The Bible doesn't mention being an electrician either, but I'm an electrician. That's okay to be a scientist or to be an electrician. But, you know, I'm not going to tell you that you're not right with God because you're not an electrician. And if you don't understand plumbing, you're not right with God. You know, and if you don't understand... Because why? It's a specialized trade for certain people. That's fine. I don't have to be interested in it. I don't have to learn about it to be right with God. And people will try to get you to believe that you must learn lots of science in order to, to be a, a well-rounded person. I don't see that in the Bible. And, and look, I know, I know my share of science. I got the highest grade in high school on my chemistry final. Ooh, big deal. And I don't really care about it ever since, okay? But I did learn a lot of science. I did well in science. I'm not running away from science tonight. But, I, I, you know, we need to be careful of science that's falsely so-called. Now, first of all, let me deal with the big one that most people think of. When you read that verse, science falsely so-called, opposing the Bible, what's the first thing you think of? Evolution, the Big Bang. Okay, that's the first thing I want to deal with tonight. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Because I look at all this from a spiritual perspective, not a scientific perspective, because I don't care about science. I care about what God said in the Bible. Okay? Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. I'm not a scientist. I don't want to be a scientist. I'm a preacher of the Bible. And guess what? That's better than being a scientist. Look at verse number 10. It says, uh, look at verse 9 actually. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. And this is of course talking about the Antichrist. It says, his coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie 
that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now the thing I want to point out here is that many people will choose to believe a lie because they love unrighteousness. Isn't that what that said? Let's read just that one last part again. Because this is such a key point. It says, For this cause, verse 11, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Those who take pleasure in unrighteousness. What is unrighteousness? A lifestyle that is contrary to God's word. Doing all the wrong things in your life. Adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, drunkenness, covetousness, murder, debate, deceit, thievery. All of it is unrighteousness. There are people who take pleasure in sin. When they go on vacation, they go to a city that they affectionately call Sin City. Where they can just abound and and indulge the flesh with sin. Why? Because they take pleasure in unrighteousness. And God says that a lot of people choose to believe a lie. They reject the truth and believe the lie because they love unrighteousness. Now, do you have to give up unrighteousness to be saved? No, because in that case, none of us would be saved. We're all sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have eternal life. The Bible says, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You don't have to turn over a new leaf to be saved. But people who love unrighteousness, they don't like the light of the glorious gospel to shine on their lives because they don't even want to believe that there is a God. They don't even want to believe that these rules even exist. They don't even want to retain God in their knowledge. They just love everything that's sinful. Now look, if you love everything that's sinful and unrighteous, when somebody shows you the Bible, are you going to love it? No, because the Bible is not unrighteous. It's not ungodly. It's not filthy and dirty. It's clean. So if you love that which is dirty, and somebody comes to your door, or somebody opens a Bible, your friend or relative or co-worker shows you the Bible and shows you cleanliness and godliness and righteousness, you're like, I don't like that. I don't want anything to do with that. I want beer. I want strip club. I want everything that's wicked. And that's the world we live in. So, we see that people willfully believe a lie... And they choose it because of their wicked lifestyle. This is backed up further in 2 Peter chapter 3. Go toward the end of your New Testament. Right before the book of Revelation. 2 Peter chapter 3 teaches something similar. Beginning in verse number 3. The Bible reads, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. These are people who make a mockery at the word of God. Scoffers. People who laugh at the word of God. It says, Scoffers will come in the last days, walking after their own what? So isn't it amazing how people who walk after their own lusts are the ones who scoff at the Bible. It says in verse 4, and saying, this is what they'll be saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they, what? Willingly are ignorant of. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. There are three things here that are listed that people are willingly ignorant of. Number one is that God created the world by His Word. Remember He said, in, he said let there be light and there was light. Remember He said let the dry land appear and he, he spoke the world into existence. That's the first thing that they're willfully ignorant of. The second thing they're willfully ignorant of is the flood whereby God destroyed the first world. The third thing that they are willfully ignorant of is the second coming of Christ and the fact that He will come back and pour out fire and wrath and indignation upon this earth. So, the the creation, the flood, and the coming judgment are the three things that these people are willfully ignorant of. You say, well, we've got to scientifically prove these people wrong. They don't want to believe the truth. They already just decided to believe a lie because of their sinful, lascivious lifestyle. Amen. The Bible doesn't say here that they got confused about science. The Bible says that they're just willfully ignorant of it. Because they are walking after their own lust. See, that was the key in verse 3. Walking after their own lust, they're willfully ignorant. 
They don't want to believe in God. Why? Because they want no rules. Because they want to live like an animal. So they want to believe that they're an animal. Hence, Big Bang and evolution. Now here's what always cracks me up about this doctrine of the Big Bang and evolution. Those who believe in it. And the word believe is the word that the Bible uses. They believe in it. No, we know it's true. Look, if you build a time machine and take me back and show me, then we'll talk. You don't know what happened thousands of years ago. I cannot say, I know what happened, you know, uh, 6,245 uh, years ago. You know, I was there. It, it's not first-hand knowledge. It's, it's all just basically been theorized. You know, thousands of years later, what things were like. That, and they'll say, oh, well, this, this painting in a cave is from... 45,000 years ago, and this one is from 65,000 years ago. And, you know, a bunch of people are writing it down, you know, like, oh, wow, that's, that's really amazing. But, but wait a minute. There's no way to know that. You believe that. You believe that that's 45,000 years old. You believe that, that, that uh, evolution is true. Now, here's what's funny about it. Those who believe in it, and it is a religion, those who believe in it, this is what they say. If you don't believe in it, you're an idiot. Isn't that their attitude? Yep. I mean, when you go to college... I was just talking to my uh, sister-in-law. And my sister-in-law, she went to a university and got a degree in science. Okay? I mean, she got a four-year degree in science. So she went to a lot of these classes. And she told me that she went to a class on evolutionary biology. And, of course, that's going to be one of the core requirements. Yeah. You know, for them to give you that piece of paper... You know, they must get into your head with all this nonsense. And obviously, it's, it's laced throughout every science class. But this particular class, evolutionary biology, the first day he said, is there, if there's anybody here who believes in the Bible, if there's anybody here who believes that the Bible is God's Word and you don't believe in evolution, you know, you need to come and, and meet with me. I'm going to be sitting at this table in the lunchroom at this and that time. You need to come talk to me. And he basically would evangelize them in the gospel of evolution. That's his version of soul winning. Okay, so he's gonna he's gonna uh, evangelize her with the gospel of evolution, and it's a fact. And you and I've heard these people. And look, who's heard them say like, "You're an idiot. You're a fool. You might as well believe the Earth is flat. You know, you're 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 retarded." And and look, they say this over and over again. But but stop and think about it for a minute. Here's what they're telling you: If you don't believe. That the greatest supercomputer in the world, in fact, it, it, it far exceeds any computer that's sitting on your shoulders right now. The human brain that no one will ever fully understand. If you don't believe that it, it just created itself out of nothing, you're an idiot. Think about what they're saying. I mean, if you don't believe that this world came from nothing, you're an idiot. I mean, they're not even offering us like a false god. They're not even offering us an alternative. It's just like, well, there was just nothing. There was just nothing. And then it just turned into stuff. <laughs> and if you don't believe that, you're being brainwashed by the Bible. You're being, you're not a, you don't know what true science is. I mean, did, does anyone else see how insane that is? But to them, it makes sense. And they think we're insane. I mean, they look at us and they're like, how can you guys believe in the Bible? But yet they believe that the world just came from nothing. I mean, look, and I like to think of it as this. I like to think of the electronic devices that we have today, okay? Because we have a lot of electronic devices that are pretty advanced, right? I mean, like this so-called smartphone that I'm holding in my hand, this is more advanced than computers that used to fill a whole room, you know, like 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, this thing is a pretty advanced piece of equipment, right? But this cannot even come close to the human mind. Have you ever seen when they try to invent robots to do tasks? And I'm not talking about science fiction, okay? I'm talking about in real life. They, I saw this thing. They created this robot that could fold towels. Okay? Did anybody see this? And this was like a major, major breakthrough. They, I mean, this is like millions of dollars. This is all this effort and work. And they showed a video of this thing folding towels. And that's all it can do. And it's just like... It picks up the towel. 
and it's just these two little pictures. It picks up the towel and it has to like look at the towel and analyze it, and then it basically folds it and puts it over here. So they show a video of it, and I watched the video, and in the video it took it, a, you know, it took it a substantial amount of time to fold the towels. It took it. Well, no, no, you haven't even heard it yet. Just wait, wait till you hear it. It took it. You know, I don't remember if it was like 30 seconds or something to go get the towel and look at it. And they said, you know what? It looks pretty impressive, but they said this video has been sped up a hundred times. And they said it actually took like, the biggest problem with this is that it took a, an hour per little hand towel. And it was just these, and it was, it was not a big towel. Oh no. It was a little, you know, or I, you wouldn't even call it a towel. What do you call it? A washcloth? When I grew up, we called it a washcloth. It's like eight inches by eight inches. It's just like... And then they showed it in real time. And they're like, you know, we put up a sped up version because it's so boring. Because in real time, it's just like, duh, what do I do with this towel, you know? And then it's slowly... So look, that's folding a towel. Now picture someone playing basketball. How many processes are going on in their mind? As they're thinking about what all the other players are doing, they're seeing stuff out of the corner of their eye, they're hearing things, they're dribbling the ball, and when they go to shoot the ball, they're controlling all these hundreds of muscles in their body, different amounts of force, different amounts of strength, they're determining distances, they're taking all these things into account. Picture someone playing the piano. Think about somebody, and you say, well, a machine can play the piano, or whatever. No, it cannot play it like a human being. It can only just... Look, I've taken hymns before, and if you feed hymns into the, the MIDI sequencer, you know what I'm talking about? And it plays them, it sounds robotic. It doesn't sound real. They can't make a machine that will play it and make it sound like when a human being plays it. Otherwise, it'll take like, you know, several hours to get through the first verse of Blessed Assurance or something, you know, as it thinks about each step of the process. And so, what I'm saying is that our minds are very, very powerful. Even the dumbest, even the, even the biggest dunce you've ever met is smarter than this phone. Literally. And their brain is doing more. Now, think about this, okay? I'm going to give you an illustration of what this theory of, of the Big Bang and evolution and the creation of life on this earth is like in regard to electronics. You see, according to evolutionists, basically, something just came to life on its own. I mean, the, the, it, it, the most amazing thing about this doctrine of evolution is not that a monkey slowly evolved into... And I know it wasn't a monkey, it was a primate, sorry. But anyway, big, big, hairy difference, you know. But anyway, you know, the biggest thing about evolution that boggles my mind, it's not the part about, you know, a lower life form getting more complicated. Now, that's a pretty big thing to swallow right there, you know. But the biggest thing is, where did that first life form come from? Because even the, the so-called single-celled organism, the paramecium or amoeba, is immensely complicated. It's extremely complicated when you study it. Uh, if you take a class in, in uh, microbiology, and I've studied microbiology, and it boggles the mind how complex these tiny little microscopic creatures are, the so-called single-celled organism. So you ask them, where did they, how did this come about? And here's what they say. They say, well, you know, there were all these conditions on our planet that just happened to be just right for life. You know, all the right things were, were there. And they said that it was raining on these rocks. There were all these rocks, and it rained on the rocks, okay? And, you know, it was raining out the building blocks that could possibly build an amino acid or, you know, something that's a far cry from life. And basically what they say is that... Uh, you know, and I'm trying to I'm trying to explain this the best I can, okay? It's stupid. But anyway, what's that? Yeah, oh, I need the glasses on. Where am I? Where am I? That's why, you know, I knew something was missing. Okay, so let me explain this, all right? So now, now we're getting somewhere. Thank you. So here's what's going on. So it's raining all these materials from the sky. You know, there was a lot of methane, or yeah, there was a lot of methane coming out of the guy's mouth. He's explaining it. But anyway, you know, there was a lot of methane. They say there was a lot of methane in the atmosphere and a lot of these chemicals. And it was raining down upon the rocks. And basically, you know, you know how rocks have like little grooves in them? And stuff stuff kind of was able to just kind of land next to each other at random. You know, if it rains long enough and kind of arrange itself into a pattern where, you know, it starts, you know, developing a self-replicating system. And then slowly it evolved into that first life form. Okay. Now, 
imagine this, and this would be more believable. And who knows about those green, those green circuit boards? Ever work on, I work on electronics for a living, so who, who knows what I'm talking about when I say the green circuit board? You know that green square thing, and it's got all the resistors and diodes and capacitors and microchips all soldered into it? Well, imagine this. Imagine a world where instead of rocks, the whole earth is just covered in those little green deals, just piles of them, just mountains of those little green circuit boards, right? And then it begins to rain from the sky, okay, resistors, diodes, <laughs> capacitors, LEDs, LCD screens, okay? And then solder is raining from the sky also. You know, like it's raining down boiling hot solder, okay? Now after millions of years, you know, basically you have a circuit that start, you know, a little light start flashing. You know, there's something coming to life here. You know, a, ba a battery started developing. You know, a light bulb started flashing, you know. And then slowly you got into like an Atari. It started to come about, you know. And then after millions more years, you, you know, you got to like Nintendo. And then you got to like, you know, Sega Genesis. And then you got to like the, pol the, the uh, play PlayStation, the PSP, you know. And then, you know, slowly you began to see the iPod developing and the Neolithic, you know. Era. No, because you and I both know that no matter how long, it rained down resistors and diodes and capacitors on that green circuit board. And, you know, they're all arranging it. And it just ran. It's never going to create a computer. It's never going to create even Pong. It's never going to come. It will not create even Pac-Man, let alone Ms. Pac-Man. Okay? It's not going to happen. And yet, it is so much more complex. That's not even life. I mean, look, can we in a laboratory... Put down a green circuit board and, and create Atari, create Nintendo, create a computer, create an iPod. Yes, we can. But can we create life in a laboratory? Nope. I mean, we can rain all the methane we want. We can get all the proteins we want. And we can mix it up. We can even do like Dr. Frankenstein of old and take a dead body with all the pieces already ready made. And we cannot bring it to life because only God can give life and no one else. Amen. We can't bring it to life. You cannot bring anything to life. And people think, well, yeah, they're cloning. No, cloning is not bringing anything to life. Cloning is where they take one thing that's already alive and they replace its DNA with a different DNA, but they did not create that life. They just altered that life. They just changed the life that was already there. It is impossible to create life. There's no such thing as spontaneous generation where something just comes to life. And even a, 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 an ingenious scientist with all, every chemical, every tool, billions of dollars of grants could not create life in a laboratory. They tried it. They would spent years and years trying to create even the most simple organism to come to life. They cannot do it because it's impossible and they'll never do it. Amen. And so this... Doctrine of evolution is something that has to be believed in by faith and it's garbage, it's nonsense, it's foolishness Amen. to think that we, the ingenious creatures that we are, just came from nothing. Let alone all the animals. Let alone all the wonderful plant life that's on our planet. And it's all so wonderfully created. And people think it just it, it invented itself. It just came from nothing. It just came from a big explosion. It came from nothing. You see, you cannot convince these people because they've made up their mind what they want to believe. And that's what it comes down to. It's a lie. It's foolishness. And here's a, a news flash for you. Before this doctrine of evolution, people were still going to hell. Yeah. Yeah, right. It's not like everybody was saved until Darwin came along. Because when people didn't have evolution to believe in, they found something else to believe in. Anything to escape the truths of God's Word. That's always been something. But I don't want to spend my whole night on that. I mean, we could, we could go on and on about the nonsense that is you know, evolution. And here's what they'll say to prove it. Well, this is what they say. Well, science, all scientists believe in it. And here's what they say. There are a few scientists who don't believe in it, but they said in the relevant fields, 100% of scientists believe in it. What they're saying is every evolutionary biologist believes in it. Because he's in the relevant field. Okay, well, what are you going to tell me next? That every Catholic priest believes in Catholicism? Well, Catholicism is true because every Catholic priest I've ever talked to believed in it. And they're the ones who know it the best. They're on the inside. 
<laughs> See, it's stupidity, because guess what? People who don't believe in evolution, they don't become an evolutionary biologist. Right. Right. Just like people who are not Catholics don't become a Catholic priest, okay? Because they don't believe in it. And here's what else they say. Yeah, you know, you get up in the pulpit and you mock science, you know, and then you drive your car and your phone and you use your phone and, and you know, you, you are benefiting from science and yet you mock and degrade science and, you know, the science that you made. For, look, evolutionary biology didn't make this phone. <laughs> Astrophysicists did not make this phone. People who studied black holes did not make this phone. This phone was made by engineers and people who studied real science and mathematics, not this crazy goofball billions and billions of years ago, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. They didn't invent this phone. They didn't invent this car. It's not just because you label it all science, that don't make it science. What ma what, you know what built my car? Real science. You know what built my smartphone? Real science. You know what came up with this theory of the Big Bang? Uh, junk science. Science falsely so called. Lies. But I don't, I've spent too much time on it. Let's go forward. But there's a lot of other science out there that's science falsely so called. First of all, the entire mental health industry. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. First of all, we've got the Big Bang and evolution. That's the obvious one. The Bible says they're willfully ignorant. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Time to put away the glasses so I don't accidentally... If I wear those glasses, I might start slipping back into that subject. So I want to stay off of that. So uh, the, the mental health industry today, the mental health industry is exploding today. I mean, it's huge. I mean, they say that the diagnoses for uh, uh, disorders like autism and ADD and ADHD and... and uh, uh, what else is it? Uh, opposition defiance disorder. You know, all these different so-called mental illnesses of, uh, of, uh, uh, of children especially. These things are literally double what they were 10 years ago or, or what have you. And the reason why they come up with all these mental illnesses is that they might give you drugs. Because they can't prescribe you a drug for, you're an idiot, take this drug. You're, you know, you, you disobey your parents. Take this drug. You need a spanking. Take this drug. No. Instead, they, they label it as a disease and a disorder. Now, it's funny because these scientists, falsely so-called, who come up with these disorders of ADD and ADHD and all this, they give it these labels, and, and I don't know if you know this, but there is no physical way for them to diagnose you with ADD. You know what I mean? Because they'll say, oh, you have a chemical imbalance, it's something in the brain. But here's the thing. It's not like you can go in and they look at your brain and say like, okay, found the problem. There it is. Because they'll flat out tell you, we cannot perceive any difference in the chemistry of a person who has ADD from someone who doesn't. We cannot tell any difference in the brain function of someone who has ADD from someone who does. There's no concrete diagnosis. It's not, let me explain to you this way. When you go to the doctor and you want to know if you have tuberculosis, it's pretty straightforward, right? They stab you with that thing and if it looks like this picture, you have tuberculosis. If it doesn't, you're fine. There's no little stab you with the thing to see if you have ADD. Because there's no physical way to tell if you have ADD. You know how they tell if you have ADT? Or ADT, you know. I guess that's who monitors your alarm. But uh, You know how they can tell if you have ADD? is just by your behavior. So basically, oh, you're obnoxious? You're a brat? You won't sit still? You won't listen? You won't obey? You won't do your work? You have ADD. Now, these me most of these mental illnesses do not exist. Amen. Let me show you what the Bible says the, the cure for mental illness is. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of what? Sound a sound mind. God can give a sound mind. Go to Mark chapter 5. I'm trying to hurry through this. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter number 5. And uh, I was going to read the whole story, but for sake of time, I'll just kind of touch on it here. The Bible says in verse 1, They came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes, and when he was come out of the ship, Jesus came out of the ship, that is, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, 
who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Now let me ask you something. Would this guy be diagnosed today with mental illness? No doubt. They'd say, wait a minute. Oh, you're cutting yourself? You are mentally ill. You need drugs. Now, maybe you haven't been exposed to people cutting themselves, but let me tell you something. This is very, very common. When I was a teenager in high school, and I'm sure it's worse now since our society is getting more and more demonic all the time. When I was in high school, I personally knew many, many teenagers who cut themselves. Who knew teenagers when you were in high school that cut themselves? Look at all the hands going up. And this was, oh, mental illness. No, it's the devil. That's right. It's wickedness. It's the witchcraft today. It's the Ouija boards. It's the music. It's the worshiping of Satan that does it. It's the gothic ones that are doing it the most. And they even have songs about it. They have poetry about it. They think it's cool. And they cut themselves. And it's demented. It's of Satan. Look at the Bible. Why don't we go to the Bible? See, you're too busy listening to sight. You need to get on the Bible. Okay? The Bible says when a guy cut himself, what was his problem? He was possessed. That's what the Bible says. There's no example of anyone harming or cutting themselves in the entire Bible unless they were possessed. Now here's what's funny. When Jesus walked this earth, did he come across a lot of people that were possessed or a few people? A lot. A lot. Remember how his disciples were just in Israel alone. Remember how his disciples were constantly casting out devils? He was constantly casting out devils. Remember that one guy was possessed with so many devils, he said our name is Legion for, because we're many? And then in this passage, he casts out the Legion, and I'm just telling you the story instead of reading the whole thing for sake of time. He casts out the Legion into the herd of swine. And the herd of swine was 2,000 swine. And when the devils entered into the pigs or the swine, they all ran off a cliff into the sea and perished in the waters. Now that tells me that there are a lot of devils in this world possessing a lot of people. Now we suddenly think today that devils do not exist. And many people today do not believe that devils exist. Now where did they go? They were here when Jesus was on this earth. They were here when the apostles were on this earth. 2,000 years later, they're still here. Okay. Now, you say, how many are there? Well, if you think about this, the Bible talks about God's throne being surrounded by over a hundred million angels. Because he says their number was 10,000 times 10,000. And thousands of thousands. A little simple math will tell you that's over a hundred million. And if a third of the angels followed Satan, what does that tell you? I mean, I'm not going to be able to give you an exact number, but even just a third of a hundred million. Okay, and, and it would be obviously more than that if there's 100 million left after the other one's already you know, went over to the other side. That'd be like, what, 50 million devils in this world. Okay, so I don't know what the exact number is. That's just food for thought. Take it, take it or leave it. When it says the third part, I don't know if it exactly means a third. But I'll tell you this, there are a lot of people possessed with devils back then, and there are a lot of people that are possessed with devils today. When you see people cutting themselves, when you see... And look, there's been some really sick, weird stuff in the news lately that people are doing. Let me tell you something. Those people are possessed with devils. Now, I'm not one of these that's on this voodoo hunt for... You know, I'm not trying to perform exorcisms or something like some Catholic priest or something. I don't believe that I have the power to just go out and just cast out devils, okay? That was a, he gave them power against unclean spirits, the apostles. He laid hand on them, and the Bible says that they did special miracles. The apostles did special miracles, okay? Everybody in the world can't just do what Jesus and the apostles did. He, otherwise, it wouldn't have been called a special miracle, okay? And obviously, there was something different about being an apostle, Remember that one guy even wanted to buy that power that they had, uh, Simon the Sorcerer, and he was rebuked for it. So, I'm not going out trying to cast out a bunch of devils today, okay? But I will say this, a lot of the so-called mental illness that's out there today is actually just people that are possessed with devils. Yep. And that's why science can't find a physical cause for a lot of this stuff, because it's a spiritual cause. That's why they can't find it. So they can do their test. They don't have a little spiritual barometer. 
<laughs> it's like, whoo, oh, yep, Satan. No, no, it's just it's just one of Satan's lower minions. Well, you only have five devils in you. You know, it's not a little meter telling you how many devils. That's why they can't figure it out. That's why they just look at you banging your head into the wall and cutting yourself, and they say, "Oh, you're mentally ill. Take this drug." No, they're spiritually ill. They are possessed. Now, let me tell you my de- devil possession stories that I've seen in my life. Now look, I don't know, and I'm not going to get up here and tell you that I know for sure, and there have been a lot of times when I've seen stuff where I wondered, like, was that person possessed? Have you ever seen something and wondered that before? You know, you're like, was that person possessed? And you know, we don't really always know for sure, do we? Whether Now, when somebody's cutting themselves, that's a pretty good sign right there, okay? But honestly, I've had some situations, in fact, just a few weeks ago I had a situation where I walk up to this guy's house, and he's, he's blasting some kind of, you know, death metal or whatever he's listening to. And I, I knock on the door. Who was I with, John? Was I with you, John? The guy, remember the guy with the weird voice? Oh, yeah. Was that you? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, So, John, John remembers the story. So, I knock on the door, and this guy's blasting some kind of death metal or whatever. So, he comes to the door... And, you know, as John pointed out, he had no shirt on. <laughs> so he's like this long-haired rocker type guy, and he's blasting this stuff. So, you know, and here's the thing. He was very friendly. He was a nice guy. He's like, oh, hey, how you doing? And, and I asked him, do you go to church? He said, no, I don't go to church. He said, I actually uh, grew up going to church. And he said, you know, and he, he was very nice and, and friendly. And I asked him, I said, do you know for sure if you die today you go to heaven? He said, you know, I don't know. So I said, well, can I just take a minute and just show you how to be saved? Out of the Bible. It'll take just, you know, ten minutes or something to go through it with you. And he said, well, he said, honestly, he said, you know, I've got to go. I've got to call a cab right now and take a cab to work. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready and I'm in a hurry. And I said, okay, I'll leave you with one verse. You know, so I quoted him a scripture. And he, you know, he listened to the scripture. He was polite. He acted like, okay, you know, that's interesting. And I said, you know, if you ever want to come by, come check us out. Okay, great. See you later. Now, and I know he was telling the truth about catching the cap because about 20 minutes later, John and I were further down the street knocking doors and we saw a cab pull up and he got in the cab and went to work. But here was the weird part. So he's really friendly to us, really nice. He wasn't, he wasn't, giggling and laughing or making fun of us or anything. It was just a normal conversation of a guy who seemed like a nice guy who was interested in what we were saying. But he just legitimately didn't have time. So he, he took one verse and that was that. So we, we start walking away and John is my witness. We start walking away. We get down to the sidewalk, walking down the next street and we just hear this voice from inside the house of this guy. And he's just like, We are faithful! We are faithful! And we're like, whoa, what was that? What is going on with that? And me and John looked at each other and just went to the next door. Now look, I don't know how to exp- Maybe the guy was just making fun of us or what he was doing. I don't know. But that was pretty weird because the guy was very normal and nice and friendly to us. And then he starts talking to us. You know. And I don't know if that's really what people talk like when they're possessed or not. But it sounded like everything that you would expect. If you're thinking about what it would be like if somebody were possessed. And you know, when this guy's blasting all this death metal, you know, who knows what kind of spirits. And that's why we need to be careful with music, by the way. The Bible says that God, in Psalm 22, inhabits the praises of Israel. The Bible says we're filled with the Spirit when we're singing and speaking to ourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. What kind of other spirits are involved with Led Zeppelin? What kind of spirits are involved with, with uh, basically these uh, Black Sabbath or, or these kind of uh, Nine Inch Nails? What kind of spirits are involved in that music? You know, I don't know. And of course, I don't believe that a, a Christian can be possessed by a devil. Uh, I don't believe that for one second. That's another sermon. But anyway, uh, I've had that experience. Another time, I was giving the gospel to a guy. And I gave this guy the gospel, and he was a Roman Catholic. And he was a devout Catholic, and he said, uh, you know, well, I believe in Jesus, but I also believe in the Virgin Mary. And, you know, he's just basically giving me all his Catholic doctrine. So I'm going through the Bible with him, showing him. And then he starts telling me, uh, and he's just really mellow, calm, smiling, talking about how he loves Mary, talking about how he loves, you know, his religion. And basically, he is uh, telling me how, you know, he, he had these visions where, he, you know, in dreams of the night, where basically 
he saw Mary appear to him in the grocery store, and then the next day he went to that same grocery store, and the same people were there. So I don't know. So he's telling me all this stuff. And I explained to him, you know, I showed him the verse in Deuteronomy where the Bible talks about, you know, sometimes you have dreams that conflict with God's word. You know, that's a false vision. That's a false, you know, uh, prophecy that's coming to you. And all of a sudden, and I didn't say anything rude, and there were other people around, and I didn't say anything rude to this guy. I was just talking to him about the Bible, talking to him about the gospel. And, and I mean, the guy just snapped. Just boing, okay? And the guy just started screaming at me. His eyes turned like bloodshot. You know, when people get really mad, their eyes get like blood in their eyes. And he's just like bloodshot. He just starts screaming at me. And basically, here was the thing. His, his wife was saved. His daughter was saved. Okay? Other members of the family were saved, but he was not saved and his son was not saved. They were the two that were still Catholic, did not believe in the, in the Bible. And so, as this guy snaps and freaks out, he stands up and he starts screaming. He said, I can see the future! I can see the future! And he said, for me and for... And he named his son. The one that's not saved. He didn't name any of his other children. He said, I can see the future for me and for so and so. And he said, it's hell! It's hell! And ran into the other room. I mean, that seemed like a guy that could have been possessed. Because all of a sudden he just snapped from being a totally normal guy. And I'm not saying that he for sure was. Maybe he just flipped out. I don't know. But I'm telling you, I've seen things like that. Another story I've often told is where my dad... Uh, he used to give the gospel to children on the street. And, and he used to take children on the street to church with them and everything like that. And, and uh, some people didn't like it, you know, because they didn't like the gospel and they hated it. And so my dad had been uh, winning some souls. And his dad, my grandpa, was a great soul winner. I mean, he knocked a ton of doors. He was always preaching the gospel. And his name, was, my grandpa's name was Andy Anderson. That's what he went by. It wasn't his real name. But he went by Andy Anderson. His real name was Dwayne. So, basically, my dad was soul winning on his street, and this guy got really mad and started yelling at my dad saying, I hear you, Andy Anderson! I hear you, Andy Anderson! And my dad's name is not Andy Anderson. That's my grandpa's name. So he's yelling at my dad, I hear you, Andy Anderson! So then, like several years later, my dad's talking to a completely different person in a different city, you know, an hour away or whatever, he's talking to a completely different person, and this person was a Baptist, but they didn't believe in hell. They did not believe that hell was eternal, they believed that hell was just figurative or whatever. So he was trying to show this person from the Bible that hell was real, and then this person just all of a sudden starts saying to him, I hear you, Andy Anderson. I hear you, Andy Anderson. I mean, that's weird to say the same thing it's not even any name he's ever gone by. And two people told him the same thing. Now look, do I know for sure? And I could, I could go on and on. I mean, I'm just giving you a little sampling of stuff. And you know, if you've been out soul winning, you might have seen some weird stuff too. We've all seen, like, like when I asked for raise hand, a lot of people were saying, yeah, I've seen people that seem like they might have been possessed. I'm not going around trying to prove, you know, if, if these stories really, I'm just telling you the stories as I saw them, or as I heard them. But the bottom line is, one thing I do know for sure is that there are people out there who really are demon-possessed, because that's biblical. And here in the Bible, let's keep reading quickly, uh, this guy, he's, he's, uh, he's not, no man can tame him, he's always night and day, verse 5, he's in the mountains, he's in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. And watch what happens, when Jesus casts out the devils into the swine, look what it says in verse number 14. And they that fled, or they that fed the swine, fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and what? In his right mind. And in his right mind. And they were afraid. So right there we see a guy who's possessed. He comes into contact with Jesus Christ and... After Jesus Christ, he, and, and the Bible is clear that he got saved because after this, you know, it, it's not that Jesus just cast out the devils. This guy actually got saved because this guy wants to follow Jesus and go with him to the next town. And Jesus says, no. He said, instead of following me, instead of coming with me, he said, I want you to go and tell all your friends, tell everybody you know what 
the Lord has done for you. You know, go around and just basically just preach the gospel. And he sends that guy out to preach the gospel. And that guy is used of God in that way. And so today, we have this, this garbage science today of mental illness. Junk science that says, oh, you know, you're cutting yourself. Oh, you're a cannibal. Oh, you're, you know, you're, you're a pedophile. Oh, you're, you're, you just have a chemical imbalance. No, you're possessed. No, you're wicked. You're involved in sin and witchcraft that has taken you down that road. It could be drugs that has gotten you into that. You know, how many cultures across the world in Africa, Native Americans, who take drugs to enter the spirit world and talk to their ancestors? They're not in the spirit world. They're not talking to their ancestors. They're talking to the devil. When they smoke drugs and when they so-called communicate with the dead with a Ouija board or through drug use or whatever it is, that is just Satanism. And people today are involved in so much Satanism and witchcraft today that they're inviting all these crazy weird spirits in and then you wonder why they're mentally ill. Schizophrenic, right? Two personalities. You know what that is? That's the legion right there. That's your personality and some other devil that's inside you taking over and and coming through. Another personality. That's all that is right there. Split personalities, multiple personality disorder. And so they've basically taken spiritual, spiritual things in the Bible out of the equation, and it's all explained by science. Of course, we can't physically explain it, but we've experimented. Sure enough, these people have two personalities. And we have this junk science. Now, quickly, I want to touch on this with children. Children today are the ones that are being put on these psychotropic drugs more than anyone else. Children today are being put on mind-altering drugs in as early as first grade, second grade, third grade. I have personally talked to many parents who basically said, my, I was told that if I don't put my children on these drugs, they will be kicked out of school. I'm being forced to put my children on these drugs. Does anybody know people like that? I've had people say, we had to put the kid on the drugs or they won't even let him come to school. Because they won't spank. That's why. The Bible says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. The Bible says, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. The Bible says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself causeth his mother shame. And instead of doing what God said and spanking the child when it's, when it's bad, when it, when it commits uh, all these offenses, they just instead try timeouts they, and look there's a lot of science there's a lot of scientific data to show that spanking doesn't work did you know that? look it up go online and look up the studies on spankings and they'll all show that spankings are harmful every scientific study will show you that spanking is harmful to your child's psyche but have you ever met a child that wasn't spanked, that wasn't the biggest monster in the world? Yeah. See how this science is lies? Why? Because there are drug companies that make billions and billions of dollars on these psychotropic drugs. They don't want you to spank your kid. They don't want you to teach your kid the Bible and bring it to church. Because they want you to teach your kid that there's no God. And then they want you to never spank or discipline the kid because they know your kid's going to be a monster and then they can sell drugs that are $800 a bottle. I mean, it's more expensive than heroin. It's cheaper to get addicted to heroin than to get on these ADD pills. That's a fact. I've spoken to people who used them. It was 800 bucks a bottle. I don't think that your crack dealer is going to charge you that much. I don't know. I've never bought crack, so how do I know? <laughs> but I'm sure, it, I'm sure that these ghetto derelicts aren't pulling out $800 out of their pocket every time they need drugs. I'd be surprised. You know, maybe one of you... You know, dope addicts can come see me after the service and crack me. I don't think we have any in our church. But anyway, look at this. This ADD industry is a money-making industry. And listen to me now. You say, preach the Bible. Okay, for the love of money is the root of all evil. That right there shows you what's behind this drugging of America and drugging of our youth and drugging of our children. And every... Look, you believe in science. You say, well, Pastor Anderson, I kind of disagree with the sermon because I believe in science. Okay, well, the same guy who's telling you that you evolved from an ape and that the whole world came from a big bang and that rain fell on the rocks to create the first life form, 
That same guy is the same one telling you that every scientific study shows that spanking doesn't work. So when are you going to realize that science is filled with lies? And that it's uh, something that's used to oppose the Bible. You see, these experiments are skewed. They lie about the results, obviously. Everybody knows that when you look at kids that are spanked, they're good, they're happy, they're healthy children. And when you look at kids that are not spanked, they're brats, they're mad, they're throwing themselves on the ground. Now, we don't even know what it's going to be like to have a generation of children that have never been spanked take the reins of our nation. Because if you talk to your average person today who's 30, 40, 50 years old who does not believe in spanking, you talk to your average person who says, oh, don't spank, you ask them, were you spanked? Did you get spanked? Yeah. Everybody I've ever met who was against spanking, I asked them, did you get spanked? They said, well, yeah, I got spanked. But I'm not going to spank my children. I'm going to stop the cycle of abuse. So <laughs> the previous generation, as, as wicked as they were, Okay, they still got spanked. But today's generation is the first generation that's just totally not spanked. Or a lot of them are. And we see the result. We see these little faggoty things strutting out of the high schools today, showing their underwear and their skinny. You see, I don't like that word. Well, you know what? I don't like seeing your rear end in your underwear, you little faggot. Okay? I'm sick of seeing your nakedness. Pull up your pants. I'm sick of it. These kids can't even pull up their pants. It's impossible. Uh, I remember a, a guy he, a guy had a, a, a teenager at his house visiting, and he said, in my house, you pull up your pants. And this kid pulled up his pants as far as they would go. And they were literally designed to be several inches below his waist. I mean, it was impossible. You know, if you know how pants are shaped, you know that part of the fabric at the bottom right here where it comes together into a V? That part was hitting something, and you couldn't pull him any further. And there was still a long way to go before he covered up his, his backside. And I see, and look, God forbid my children will never wear those clothes. Do not let your children dress like a sodomite. And I, you, you, you know, I'm not saying everybody who dresses that way is a sodomite. I'm just saying you look like a sodomite. Yeah. Pull up your pants. Wear a belt like Jesus did. He had a, he had a gird, he, his loins were girded, the Bible says. Okay, uh, wear a belt like Elijah, wear a belt like John the Baptist, okay? Wear a belt and pull up your pants and don't look that way. But, but that's the generation today that if you ask them, they all think being a homo is fine. They all think evolution's true. They believe this garbage. They have no morals. They have no uh, resistance toward fornication. Or they, they, they watch every bit of filth on TV. They have tolerance for all manner of sin. They think drinking and drugs are fine. We see the generation today, and God forbid, when they're running our country. After they've been brainwashed in a government school and institution, and they have been, uh, they've rejected the Bible, and they've not been spanked. Look, just the fact that they've not been spanked is enough for them to turn out bad, according to the Bible. But there's plenty of science to show you that spanking's harmful. Even though me and my three siblings were all spanked a lot by my parents, and we all turned out to be God-fearing, we all, all, me and all three of my siblings, we all go to independent fundamental Baptist churches, we're all serving God, we all believe the Bible, okay? We all love our parents, we all have a relationship with our parents, but yet spanking is going to make people hate their parents. I love my parents. I thank them for spanking me. My children, look at my six children lined up there. They're smiling. They're happy. Have you, have you seen how they're all sitting there quietly this whole sermon? And they've been listening to the preaching? Have you seen them behaving and paying attention? Why are they paying attention? Why are they behaving? Why are they smiling? Why are they happy? Because they've been disciplined and raised according to the scriptures. And yet science will tell you that doesn't work. Well, what do you say to that science? What do you say to that row of kids? What do you say to me and my three siblings? What do you say to all the other godly Christians that I know who are raising good kids? By disciplining. And what do you say to the brats in the grocery store throwing themselves on the floor? No, no. Mom's going to give you a time out. Or the counting. One, two, three. And one time I heard a lady get up to like 13. And I walked by. We were in Michigan on vacation. This is when we used to live over in that part of the country. And, and, and she's like, you know, 13. And I walked up. I was like, 50. 
Seven? <laughs> and the woman just gave me the dirtiest look. <laughs> I should have been minding my own business. I was like, 57? You know, and you got to get more extreme because it starts out just like, one, two, and it, build, it builds the intensity. Three, 27! You know, it just, it just builds up and it just... And, and then my wife said, my wife told me a couple days ago, she said, oh, I heard a new one. Now it's counting down. Starting at five and going down. So what are you saying? You have five seconds to fool around before I'm even going to think about enforcing what I'm saying. I mean, if I did that, if I said to my kids, you got five seconds to go over here. Five, four, three. You know what my kids would do? They'd, they'd probably just like stand there. <laughs> and right when you're like, one, it's just going to be like, a, a gun was fired. They're going to get right to it. <laughs> but look, there's a lot of science back it up. Hey, there's a lot of science to prove global warming is true. Just ask Al Gore. You know, and yet how many times has this stuff been debunked and proven to be false? But yet it's backed up by science. There's a consensus. And Al Gore will tell you, he'll tell you if you don't believe in, in global warming, he says, you know, basically that's equivalent to believing that the earth is flat, according to him. If you don't believe in man-made global warming. The, you know, I have this huge list. I'm not going to get to any more of this tonight. But, you know, the gay gene. Read Romans 1. There's your double helix of how sodomites became sodomites in Romans chapter 1. He explains how they got that way. They weren't born that way. They got that way by following the step-by-step -step process that's laid out in Romans chapter 1. And there's so much more. I'm going to save some of this for another sermon because there's a lot of things out there that are science falsely so-called. So what's the moral of the sermon? What's the bottom line? It all comes down to this. It comes down to the fact that at the end of the day... The Bible has to be our final authority, Amen. not so-called science. We need to stop worshipping science. If science can come up with the Big Bang and evolution, that should tell us that science can make other mistakes too. If science is going to tell us that life, things came to life by themselves magically, that should tell us that there's other lies in science. If they've been caught with fraudulent scientific data on global warming, that should tell us, hey, we can't trust everything these people say. And I, I wonder why they lie to us. I mean, they're driving a Lexus. They're driving a Mercedes. I mean, why would Al Gore lie? I mean, he's flying around in a private jet. Why would they lie? What do they have to gain? Money. Yeah, exactly, money. These professors, these scientists, you know what it is? You come up with the science that corporations like, we'll give you a grant of millions of dollars. You try to do a study that shows why vaccines are bad, you're not getting any money from the government. You're not getting any money from Big Pharma to do a study on what's wrong with vaccines, to do a study on how mental health drugs and ADD drugs are making things worse and causing more mental health problems? No, but when you do a study saying spanking doesn't work, Big Pharma's there to write the check. And when you're doing a study to show that ADD is a real illness, you know, Big Pharma's there to cut you a check. Satan himself is there to cut you a check. When you're doing a study to prove evolution and prove the Big Bang, they'll write you checks for that all day long. You start going against the mainstream, you start going against the status quo, you don't get the money. And when there's no money, you can't do this stuff. You can't sit around, like, like me, I'd love to sit around and experiment on science all day. It sounds fun, right? But you know what I'm doing? Working. Making a living, right? So in order to do these experiments all day and study science, somebody's got to pay you to do it, right? And who's paying the bills? The government pharmaceutical companies because you have to have some financial interest in supporting this stuff and yeah there are some good scientists out there who get money from legitimate sources but they're so few in number compared to the multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical machine that can pump money into this godless so-called science but without believing me on any of that take God's word for it there's science out there that's falsely so-called so the moral of the sermon is this when you hear something coming from science take it with a grain of salt every time Amen. when somebody tells you well science tells us this well the scientific data shows this just say hey thus saith the Lord Amen I'd rather listen to the Bible than science any day of the week. Why? Science changes all the time. The Bible never changes. Science is sometimes wrong. 
The Bible's never been wrong. Do you see why the Bible is superior to science? And so people say, well, you don't believe in science. I just say, yeah, you're right, I don't. Yeah, what are you going to do about it, huh? I don't believe in science. Yeah. Because you know what? I believe this book. Okay, And this book has proven science wrong again and again and again. Let's bow our heads in that word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, dear God. We thank you for the rock of our salvation. We thank you for the rock that is the word of God. I thank you that I don't have to base my child rearing on an experiment that really hasn't even been tried in a mass scale. And whenever it has been tried, it's produced children that were monsters and children that became reprobates and children that grew up and became criminals and wicked people. Father, help us to just trust in you, not to lean on science, falsely so-called. Whatever kind of so-called science, help us to just lean on your word and trust in you alone and help your word to be our final authority. Uh, As you said that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Help us to realize your word is perfect and it it has to uh, supersede anything else. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's go ahead and sing one song before we go. Anybody have a song? They'd like this. The Solid Rock. There we go. 125. Let's sing one.